it is very difficult for some reason to obtain permission to treat patients in the United States. Uh, I think this country has the finest uh, bureaucratic regulations in the world and the other countries are way behind. Here, the patient has to go to very difficult bureaucratic process, uh, which uh, usually most of the patients will not be able to go through because they die during the process. For some reason, they don't want to have cure of cancer. My name is Sergeant Rick Schiff. I'm an 11-year veteran of the San Francisco Police Department. I hold the department's highest medal of honor for bravery. That used to mean a lot more to me than it does now. What I'd like to talk to you about today is my now seven-year-old daughter. This is an identical twin. Her sister is now dead. Her sister, when she was four years old, Kristen, developed a highly malignant brain tumor that had spread throughout her spine and her brain. The doctors told us that we had really two options, take her home, let her die, or bring her in for massive dosages of chemo and radiation simultaneously. In either event, she was going to die. They were quite certain of that, and very quickly. Uh, believing her only chance to be the standard route, we gave her the chemo and radiation. It burned her skull so bad she had second degree burns and her hair never came back. To change her diapers, we had to wear rubber gloves because her urine was so toxic and it burned her. At the end of six months, Miraculously, she survived the standard treatment, although there was a high expectation she wouldn't. Um, she still had cancer. We were told, sorry, we've done everything we can. Now she's going to die, probably within a couple of months. My wife and I, choosing not to accept that, started reading. The first book I picked up, the third chapter, discussed Dr. Brzezinski. Um, as you may guess, I have some expertise in fraud. In fact, I'm quite certain there are enough attorneys in the room that I could be vordeered as an expert in fraud. And I conducted my own investigation. I have no doubt the man is not a fraud. I have no doubt that he does what he does out of earnest belief that his medicine works. And now you're in a position to judge for yourselves whether it works or not. But it's well established by the FDA that it's non-toxic. Eighteen months later, we took my daughter off the antineoplastin. She had not died. She had no signs of tumor. She remained free for 18 months of cancer. Within a month, the cancer was widespread in her brain. We put her back on Brzezinski's. By the way, at the objections of our doctors, for some reason felt that it had failed her. We put her back on. Within nine weeks, the tumor was completely gone. She died last July of neurological necrosis. Her brain fell apart from the radiation. The autopsy showed that she was completely cancer-free. Out of 52 cases of that disease ever, no one died cancer-free, just Chrissy. So she didn't die of a terminal illness. She died of my inability to care for her properly, and she died from bad advice. She died because there's a government institution that disseminates false information and is not looking out for the welfare of the people. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I swore an oath 11 years ago, and I think most of us in this room swore it at one time or another to uphold the Constitution. It says life right in the beginning. I first heard of Dr. Brzezinski back in the late 1980s when he was in a battle with the Texas Medical Board and the FDA regarding his innovative approach to cancer. I wasn't surprised by that. Anyone who's innovative in medicine creates waves in the medical system. However, in his case, I was continually surprised that they didn't put him out of business. I kept hearing about him. So in the mid-1990s, I said, Dr. Brzezinski, I want to come down to visit your clinic and find out what you're doing. It's very new to me. When I arrived, he had seven charts ready for me to review that had been reviewed by the National Cancer Institute, who also made a site visit the year before. The National Cancer Institute reported that these seven patients were either in complete remission or there was substantial improvement. I was astounded. Dr. Brzezinski had MRIs of brain tumors known to be almost universally fatal that had simply disappeared. A Polish native named Stanislaw Brzezinski attended Lublin Medical University 
where he graduated first in his class at age 24 and then received his PhD in biochemistry the following year. While undergoing his research to acquire his PhD, Dr. Brzezinski made a profound discovery. He found a strain of peptides in human blood and urine that had never before been recorded in biomedical research. As his curiosity in these peptides evolved, he made another profound observation. People who were inflicted with cancer seemed to lack these newly discovered peptides in both their blood and urine, while those who were healthy and free of cancer appeared to have an abundance of these peptides. Dr. Brzezinski theorized that if he could somehow provide a way to chemically extract these peptides from the blood and urine of healthy donors and administer these peptides to those with cancer, perhaps it could be useful in treating the disease. Before I started, I asked the lawyers for the advice. Can I use experimental treatment, which was the treatment of angioplastins? Can I use this in my private practice? And can I be involved in cancer research? Simple uh, as uh, the private company. Dr. Brzezinski's attorneys investigated both state and federal law to find out if it was legal for him to start his own biomedical research company making antineoplastons and administering them to his patients within his private practice. They found that according to both the Texas state and federal law, the use of any drug or new drug can be used to meet the immediate needs of the patients of a licensed doctor, particularly when there is no other available option for them. The law stated that such activity was not governed at the time by the Texas Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and is not otherwise unlawful under the laws of the state of Texas. However, Dr. Brzezinski would not be legally allowed to introduce or deliver antineoplastons into interstate commerce, which means he had to keep his activities only within the state of Texas to avoid breaking any federal laws. As long as he did this, his actions were not within the regulatory authority of the FDA. However, once word began to spread that Dr. Brzezinski was successfully treating what was once considered terminal incurable cancer patients, people began traveling from all over the country to receive antineoplaston treatment. We're talking with Dr. Stanislaw Brzezinski, who is an MD and a PhD, has done some experimental work in the area of cancer, and has come up with some very interesting studies, which have been backed up by about four and a half years of investigation. We've had two patients who appear to be in differing states of uh, remission. Now, we started to talk a little bit about the medical community's acceptance of all of this. Um, how is your research funded? Uh, initially, my research was funded from National Cancer Institute and from uh, Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, after I decided to open my laboratory, the only funds available for me were loans from the banks uh, patients' fees and uh, payments from the insurance companies. C could you stand for just a minute, Dr. Gardner? This is Dr. Harold Gardner. Now, is, is there anything about this that you find controversial? I mean, his treatment, does it have a good scientific background hypothesis and really controlled studies uh, behind it? Yes, as, as the science of, uh, of investigation goes, Dr. Brzezinski's studies have been uh, quite professional certainly as creditable as most uh, at Wayne State and the University of Michigan and others which uh, uh, I'm tied to directly. The controversy is less in his approach uh, on a therapy basis than it is his approach organizationally. And much of the medical and hospital industry operates as a very closed shop. And if you have ideas that might in one way or another jeopardize that, uh, economic base, uh, you fall into disfavor very quickly. That, that is an, an incredible statement that you've just made. And uh, I've been involved with several patients who have chosen options uh, in Europe and in Canada, and those options are not available in this country because uh, of economic and organizational reasons, not because of scientific reasons. Thank you. Uh, what? Um, what? For a long time, I didn't have any contact with Texas Board of Medical Examiners until around 1984. Some of my patients told me that they were approached by 
uh, the agents sent to them from Texas Board of Medical Examiners who are trying to convince them to file complaints against me. Uh, so this was shocking to me. And what is surprising that they were using the state money, they were using taxpayers' money to travel long distance, like from Houston to California, to convince our patients who are in California to file complaints against me. This was completely irrational. But nothing else happened at the time until I met, by coincidence, Vice President of the MD Anderson Cancer Center, Dr. Hickey, who informed me that I will have problems this time with Texas Board of Medical Examiners. And obviously the problems began. And uh, I was called to the Texas Board of Medical Examiners. They began investigating me. However, there were no complaints from the patients. The patients were happy. We were treating patients who were very advanced, for whom there was no treatment available, and they were getting good results. So apparently there was no justification for such action. This was a very unpleasant investigation. They were trying to convince me again to stop my research, to stop treating patients. After about two years of going back and forth and being called uh, to the board, uh, finally they proposed to me that I should present to them a number of cases of patients who benefited from my practice. And they informed me that uh, such medical records will be reviewed by uh, expert oncologist, and if they are satisfied that I am not harming patients, that the patients are benefiting from my activity, then they will leave me in peace. I was very happy with this. I believe that Texas Board will do objective review of our results, and finally they will leave me alone, because we had amazing results in the treatment of very difficult cancer cases. I supplied to them twice as many medical records, which show without any doubt great results in the cancer treatment. Uh, incurable forms of cancer completely disappearing, with patients going to complete remission, and patients who were cured and living normal life after that. After submitting these cases to the medical board, he didn't hear back from them, leaving him to assume that the board was satisfied and would leave him in peace. However, two years later, the board came back again, pretended that the cases he submitted were not successful, and claimed he was violating a law that didn't exist, which was grounds for the board to cancel, revoke, or suspend his license. It was a shock to me. I believed in justice, I believed in high ethics of the board, but this was just a lie. The medical board had no case against Brzezinski, which prompted the board to file their first amended complaint in 1990, Still, the board had no case, which prompted them to file a second amended complaint in 1992. After about five years of this, 60 of Dr. Brzezinski's patients petitioned the board to stop harassing their doctor. The board then tried to ignore these petitions by attempting to strike them from the record. Finally, in May of 1993, this case went to trial. I had never heard of Dr. Brzezinski. I didn't know anything about him. I never was quite clear what the board's problem was. The board did not bring any expert witnesses to contest points that were raised by Dr. Brzezinski. Now, without an expert witness to render an opinion in certain areas, I can't give any credence to opinion raised by a layman. And Dr. Brzezinski brought in uh, Dr. Uh, Nicholas Patronus. Some of the most dramatic testimony on Dr. Brzezinski's behalf came from Dr. Nicholas Patronus, Doctor, you have to say that there, a Georgetown University expert who was a member of the National Cancer Institute's team that analyzed seven of Dr. Brzezinski's cases. The basic conclusion was that uh, in five of the patients with uh, brain tumors uh, that were fairly large, the tumor uh, resolved, uh, disappeared. It's amazing, the fact that they are leaving. It's impressive and unbelievable. He was quite a witness. He said he had never seen anything like what Dr. Brzezinski was able to accomplish with his antineoplastons in brain cancer. He had one young boy there who had been treated, he was about 12 at the hearing, strapping lad, good-sized boy. But when he was, he was first started on treatment when he was about four years old. I think his name was Paul. He was given up on by his original doctor. When Mary Michaels took the stand on behalf of her son, Paul, she trained her eyes on the state's attorney. 
I mean, I have enough to worry about when I go to bed at night about my son and my family. I don't need to worry that this treatment's going to be taken away. What do you think might happen if... Oh, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> I have no other questions. For all I know, the kid may still be alive. The tumors will grow, they will lose the vision, they will be paralyzed and they will die because there's nothing in the world which can be used to save this patient's life. You intend to continue doing just what you've been doing until somebody is able to stop you. Is that not true? I'm going to do what the law will allow me to do, Mr. Helcom. I do whatever is necessary to bring my medicines to approval in the United States and everywhere in the world and bring you to justice for causing the death of 200 patients. And they will come back here to haunt you until you are dead. Are you threatening me, Dr. Brzezinski? I'm not threatening you, but that's what's going to happen in the future. Well, I think that's something that will be remains to be seen. They weren't real happy with me. I could tell that from the way they were talking to me and asking questions. Then they told me after they were going to rewrite my proposal for a decision and take adverse action against Dr. Brzezinski, and I said, I thought that was rather foolish. The state of Texas wants Houston doctor Stanislaw Brzezinski to stop treating his patients with drugs he produces at his own pharmaceutical plant. The drugs called anti-neoplastins are non-toxic compounds of proteins and amino acids, often lacking in cancer patients. Even though the state of Texas acknowledges that the drugs may be helping some who are terminally ill, the state says the drugs shouldn't be used. This is the State Board of Medical Examiners, which licenses doctors in Texas. This is the agency challenging Dr. Brzezinski in court. One judge has already told the board members that they don't have a case. All of this nonsense which is going now should disappear because they should realize that uh, I am right, okay? They're fighting losing battle. I am saving human lives. And if they put me out of business, the people will die. This is the brain of an eight-year-old boy with a huge tumor most thought would kill him. He used Dr. Brzezinski's drug. Images of his skull taken six years later show the tumor has almost disappeared. Dr. Bruce Cohen is the director of neurologic oncology at the prestigious Cleveland Clinic. The only explanation is that it's shrunk because of the therapy Paul has received. He confirmed Dr. Brzezinski's results on Paul. Seven years that we've had Paul and he's been healthy and I owe it to this man. And there's no way that I'd ever be able to thank him enough for what he's done for us. Today that boy Paul Michaels and his anxious family sit in the courtroom with other patients. Undeterred by the 1993 ruling, the Texas Medical Board took Dr. Brzezinski to a higher district court. Of course, this time, they knew they couldn't raise any issues about whether or not his treatment was effective. The Texas State Board of Medical Examiners, which has fought to suspend Dr. Brzezinski's license because his treatments have never been approved, says, quote, the efficacy of anti-neoplastons in the treatment of human cancers is not of issue in these proceedings. It takes a bureaucrat to come up with that idea because a layman, that would really be the question. Well, Dr. Brzezinski has won his latest round in court. The medical examiner's order was reversed, but that is not expected to be the end of his trouble with the state of Texas. The Texas Medical Board took this case all the way to the Texas State Supreme Court, leaving the Texas Medical Board completely unsuccessful in their efforts to remove his medical license. So if efficacy was not an issue and Dr. Brzezinski wasn't breaking any laws, then why would the Texas Medical Board continue on with this empty pursuit? Well, it was eventually realized, even by the mainstream press, that the Food and Drug Administration had been pressuring the Texas Medical Board to continue trying to take away Dr. Brzezinski's medical license. For this story, we wanted to talk to the FDA about its policies and procedures. The agency did agree to talk to us on background where it wouldn't be quoted, but it repeatedly refused our requests for on-camera interviews. While they were busy pressuring the Texas State Medical Board to try to revoke Dr. Brzezinski's medical license, they were even busier trying to revoke Dr. Brzezinski completely from society by trying to place him in prison. 
On March 12, 1976, FDA Bureau of Drugs Director Richard Kraut states in the cancer letter, when anyone other than large institutions ask permission to conduct clinical trials, you want harsh regulations. Sometimes we say it is proper to hinder research. And once these guidelines were adopted, the FDA would consider itself bound by them. In 1982, Kraut states again, I never have and never will approve a new drug to an individual, but only to a large pharmaceutical firm with unlimited finances. And so the fiercest fight in FDA history began. Dr. Brzezinski's dealings with the FDA commenced in 1983. At that point, the FDA commenced a civil action to try to close the clinic and stop all patients from receiving the me medicine. Before the judge in this case had announced her ruling, the FDA sent her a letter warning her in advance, if this court declines to grant the injunction sought by the government, thus permitting continued manufacture and distribution of antineoplastons, the government would then be obliged to pursue other less efficient remedies, such as actions for seizure, also known as raiding his clinic and home, and condemnation of the drugs, also known as a propaganda campaign, or criminal prosecution of individuals, also known as throwing Dr. Brzezinski in prison. Regardless of these threats from the FDA. The judge in the case basically said that he can treat anybody he wants in Texas, but he can't ship his medicine in interstate commerce. The FDA viewed that as a failure and told Dr. Brzezinski at the time, his attorneys at the time, that they have other ways to get him. Let's talk about the other ways. In 1985, the FDA convened, uh, convened a grand jury to uh, hear evidence to try to uh, uh, indict Dr. Brzezinski. In connection with that, they had a uh, raid uh, of his clinic where they seized 200,000 pieces of paper, including all of his medical records of all patients. A little difficult to practice medicine when you don't have uh, medical records. Obviously, they came out and uh, uh, they confiscated all of our medical records. And uh, it took us uh, about uh, 12 years or 14 years to recover these medical records. In the meantime, we are permitted to make copies of the medical records in their office, but uh, it was also the neglect of human well-being. We are treating very sick people, they took medical records and uh, we needed these medical records to really <laughs> fight for the lives of these patients, but they took this away. They, they didn't care for these patients. The patients could die. They were not important. They presented the evidence to the grand jury. No indictment. 1986, they come back, seize another 100,000 documents. No indictment. I just have real trouble in knowing how much pain yes. and what people go through with cancer. And since 1967, you've been saying, I can take care of that. And people are going, forget it. Don't pay any attention. And, you had, and you've gone outside the country and they say, fine. And here we say, no. Are we that bad? Doctor? Yes. Well, it's what do you mean? Yes. 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 Are we that bad? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's really unfortunate that there's a big gap between people's pain and suffering and what the powers that be are willing to accept to give, you know, to be able to treat. It's difficult for doctors to belie 10, 12 years of, of training. And, and go against that and believe that some man, some guy from Houston has come up with something. Isn't part of your problem that uh, the treatment of cancer is a very profitable industry for a lot of companies and that your uh, treatment right now will eat into those companies' profits? And Bingo. Do yes. anything. <laughs> that there are the people who give the chemotherapy and people like that and the drug companies would have a very good reason for not helping you out. Well, I, I, I would disagree with that uh, from the standpoint that uh, as Dr. Brzezinski's pointed out himself, the patients he's treating are patients uh, who are not currently eligible for chemotherapy or radiation. Uh, if we were to find a new drug uh, that uh, uh, had a high cure rate uh, of, of cancer, it would give us the opportunity uh, to treat uh, many patients in whom uh, we don't have potential effective therapies now. 1990, another grand jury, either the second or the third. They present uh, more documents. Dr. Bensitsky testifies extensively before the grand jury. No indictment. 1991 to 1993, 
FDA investigates Dr. Brzezinski. We don't know if the uh, evidence was presented to another grand jury. 1994, another grand jury. No indictment. 1995, another grand jury. This grand jury started uh, in March of uh, this year. On March 25th, I believe, it was Dr. Brzezinski, along with a few of his patients, appeared on CBS show this morning. Let me play devil's advocate. Here you all, very desperate folk, have had undergone some cancer treatment, correct? No. None, I none had, at all for you? I, I none had at all no for you. treatment. Let me go, go, go after these guys then for a second. Had undergone some treatment. Could it not have been that the treatment that you received prior to Dr. Brzezinski's treatment was what, in fact, really cured you? Well, I'll jump on that. No way, because the recurrence I had was in a brand new spot that had not been involved before. So if all the uh, punishment that I went through for the year went out of my system and after it went out of my system, all of a sudden a new tumor comes in, how could that first treatment have helped the subsequent tumor? Later that day, the FDA came in another raid. More patient documents, uh, more subpoenas. We were flooded with calls last Friday with people wanting to know how to get a hold of you. They're going to see this story this morning, see that you've been uh, uh, raided by the, by the FDA, and they're going to want to know if you are for real or if, if the concerns are the, uh, of the FDA may have something to do with, uh, with your treatments and, and the viability of your treatments. Well, I don't think, let me jump in here, I don't think there's really an issue, as I mentioned, regarding the safety of the drug, and the FDA isn't contending at this point that the drug doesn't work. The only issue is that according to the FDA, it has not been proven by controlled clinical trials. So at least in terms of safety, the FDA isn't saying that it's not safe and the FDA isn't even saying that, that it doesn't work, right? Right now, they're just contesting or apparently they're contesting uh, whether Dr. Brzezinski himself has been shipping the medicine out of state, which in some respects is quite ridiculous since he has approval to ship the medicine out of state to various cancer institutions around the country. He ships it out of the country to various countries because it's being used in other places and uh, he ships it to individuals who have been granted permission by the FDA uh, to receive the medicine under what's called a compassionate use uh, INDs. Okay. May, June and July, more witnesses testified before the grand jury, more documents. So we've had now four, five or six grand juries. Let me talk about the subpoena practices. Most recently, the FDA has now subpoenaed the medical records of every patient who has gone on TV and told their story about Dr. Brzezinski. We'll let the committee judge what they think of that. We talk about dissemination of false information by the FDA. 1985, FDA tells anyone who calls uh, and inquiring about Dr. Brzezinski that he's being criminally investigated. When the judge on the case found out about that, he issued a cease and desist and a strong reprimand against that. The FDA, uh, FDA now has refined this tactic. Instead of waiting for people to call up the FDA, what they've done is subpoena all the records about, from Dr. Brzezinski about his business associates and all the researchers around the world, and there are many of them who are researching antineoplastons, his therapy. Now what they're doing is systematically contacting everyone who does business with him, who may do business with him, and telling about the grand jury investigation and subpoenaing documents. I believe that they're doing this in order to make uh, the FDA, to make it more difficult for him to do business. I'd like the following questions to be asked to the FDA. How much money have they spent in the last 10 years to try to put Dr. Brzezinski out of business? How many documents can they subpoena, and how many more grand juries does he does have to go to? And why can't patients who have advanced cancer seek the medical uh, treatment of their choice? Upon the commencement of the FDA's 1995 grand jury against Dr. Brzezinski, an oversight and investigation subcommittee was organized by Congressman Joe Barton in an attempt to intervene in the FDA's relentless harassment of Dr. Brzezinski and his patients. In my opinion, you have every right to use the investigative authority and the, and the judicial resources of the federal government through the Justice Department to convene a grand jury. That's very appropriate. The first time, perhaps even the second time. It becomes questionable the third time, the fourth time, and the fifth time. It is not, I think, an unlogical conclusion to think that the FDA has a vendetta against Dr. Brzezinski or wants to retaliate for some reason. Now, that's, that's my opinion. How many grand jury investigations have to occur that result in <laughs> 
in, in no finding of fault before you as commissioner of the FDA would, would, would uh, encourage those within your uh, organization to cease and desist. Mr. Chairman, how do you know that there were no findings of fault that were returned from that grand jury? There have been no indictments returned. Mr. Chairman, I ask counsel to comment, but I don't think those are the same. As a matter of law, those are the same things. I'm, I'm baffled by the, uh, the uh, splitting of hairs here, but... I, I'm just trying to understand the exchange between the witness and the chairman. What I understood the chairman to say is that there have been four grand juries convened? At least four. I just uh, am left then with a rather strong inference that if you convene four separate grand juries and there's no indictment returned, Notwithstanding, the prosecutors tell us always that it's possible to indict a ham sandwich, uh, uh, that probably there's not much there. Dozens of Dr. Brzezinski's patients who had traveled to Washington, D.C. from all corners of the United States stood up and expressed their outrage with the FDA and Commissioner David Kessler. The FDA has made a list and decided who can live and who will die. I guess I didn't make that list. I have had no chemotherapy. I have had no radiation. I chose Dr. Brzezinski instead after a lot of research and a lot of searching. I've been in remission since 1989. Dr. Kessler, I'm not a statistic. We're frustrated that our rights, constitutional rights, have been violated. This has got to end. My children are asking me, Daddy, what does the future hold? My one daughter wrote a letter to the president of this country and said, please don't pull the plug in my daddy. And that just broke my heart and, and broke my wife's heart. My husband is a walking miracle. 16 months ago, the doctors told us there's nothing else they can do. And they told us to enjoy what little life he has left. Look at him, he biked 32 miles after being on Dr. Brzezinski's treatment for two months. And they're saying we can't have it? I have a report from my family physician which tells how well I am doing. My tumors are leaving my body and my, my condition is improving every day. Now the FDA is saying to me, no, your doctor is a criminal. He should be put in jail and he needs to be shut down. This is criminal. I want the FDA to get out of our lives and stay out of her doctor-patient relationship. What the classical conventional medicine had to do for me <clears throat> was there, nothing. For me, the next thing was the minister. I did not want to undergo chemotherapy, which uh, I had a new name for, Killam therapy, uh, or any type of radiation. I was extremely lucky I found Dr. Borzinski, and uh, I don't want the FDA to take this right from me. I came 18 years ago from communist Romania, and the tyrannous dictator Ceausescu never stopped a doctor from treating anybody. How can we have something like this in the United States? barely a week after these hearings. On November 20th, 1995, Dr. Stanislaw Brzezinski was indicted. Brzezinski was charged with 75 counts of violating federal law and fraud. If convicted, Brzezinski would face a maximum of 290 years in a federal prison and $18.5 million in fines not to mention what would happen to his patients. He is their last chance for life, but now the federal government is issuing a death sentence for the patients of this cancer doctor. On February 9th, Houston federal court judge Sim Lake ruled Dr. Brzezinski's treatments have been, quote, illegal under Texas and federal law since 1984, and he ordered them stopped on all but a handful of patients. Then he put a stay on his own order a stay of execution. I believe that most of these 100, 300 people will die within a short period of time if the treatment is stopped. 
In 1996, not only did scores of Dr. Brzezinski's patients return to Washington, D.C. to protest his indictment, but many of them testified again before another congressional hearing headed by Congressman Joe Barton. Our first uh, witness is Marianne Canary, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, from uh, Aurora, Minnesota. So. This is Dustin Canary, and he is on Dr. Brzezinski's antineoplastin treatment. This is my husband, Jack Canary. Now, in February of 1994, our lives were drastically changed. My son, Dustin, was only two and a half years old at the time. He was diagnosed with a brain tumor the size of a golf ball. The surgeon removed 75% of his tumor, and the remaining 25% was diagnosed from a biopsy as a malignant, very aggressive medullar blastoma brain tumor, one of the most deadly forms of brain cancer. The doctors told us Dustin had only a few months to live. The first treatment offered us was radiation, but the radiation doctor told us that at his young age, Dustin would become a vegetable and it would only extend his life for maybe a few months. The next doctor wanted us to enroll Dustin in an experimental chemotherapy, which was highly toxic. The side effects would include hearing loss, um, kidney and liver damage, bladder, stunted growth, and a possible leukemia. I, I, one question I would like to ask is, would you do that to your child? We weighed the harm these experimental drugs would cause against the fact that they would not cure Dustin and decided not to subject him to these drastic measures. But our oncologists told us that their opinion took precedence over us as parents. This put added stress to the already stressful situation we were in. In April of 1994, we visited Dr. Stanislaw Brzezinski in Houston. Dr. Brzezinski made us no promises, but said that he often had very good results with brain tumors. At worst, it would not hurt Dustin, and it offered the best hope and a longer quality of life. An MRI six weeks after we started Dr. Brzezinski's treatment revealed no tumor. We were very overjoyed. Dustin continued antineoplastin therapy, and one year later, a tumor one inch by one inch in size was found on the MRI. In, that would be April of 1995. Dr. Brzezinski immediately raised Dustin's dose of antineoplastins. There were still no harsh side effects at all. The next MRI in September of 1995 revealed that the tumor had almost disappeared again. To this day, it has not reappeared. If you look at Dustin right now, he is a happy, healthy four-year-old who has outlived his prognosis. There is no traditional treatment that would have kept him alive with such good quality of life. FDA Commissioner David Kessler loves to grab headlines as a man who loves children so much he wants to protect them from the ravages of smoking. If Dr. Kessler loves children so much, why have he and his agencies been trying so hard to cut off my son's last hope for life? Without this treatment, my son will die. <laughs>
This is a photo of Dustin Canari at four years old in 1996. This is a photo of Dustin Canari at 22 years old in 2013, happily married. And this is a photo of Dustin Canari today, paying it forward by helping to save the lives of others as a firefighter and paramedic. American cancer patients from now on will have faster and easier access to more promising therapies. Here in a nutshell is the importance of each of the President and the FDA's four proposals. First, for patients with refractory, hard to treat cancer, instead of requiring evidence of clinical benefits such as survival, FDA will rely on objective evidence of partial response, such as tumor shrinkage, as an initial basis for approval. This will allow us to rely on smaller, shorter studies for the initial approval of cancer drugs. The second proposal, we will expedite the availability of promising medications that have been approved in certain other countries. Third, we will include representatives of cancer patients in FDA's cancer advisory committees and thereby make sure that their views are heard when it comes to recommending approval or non-approval of cancer drugs. And fourth, we will eliminate unnecessary paperwork that used to delay or discourage cancer research by non-commercial clinical investigators. I'd be happy to take a few questions. Yes, sir. Will uh, FDA's initiatives that you announced today expedite the current review of anti-neoplastons treatments? The FDA's initiatives will allow the agency to rely on smaller trials, fewer patients, if there is evidence of partial response in clinical trials. I don't want to get into any particular agent, except let me point out that the information needs to be part of clinical trials. We will accept less information up front. We're going to require further study after approval because the science has matured. But the important point is that information needs to be gathered through scientific means, through clinical trials. And I think that's that's a very important, uh, very important point. You can't just use an agent here or there. You have to use it as part of a clinical trial so we can get information on whether the drug works. Will, will patients uh, who have taken other forms uh, of cancer treat treatments, chemo or radiation treatments, uh, be allowed to participate in trials uh, for anti-neoplastons? The uh, agency has many trials, has, has approved trials for patients with anti-neoplastins, yes. What are anti-neoplastins for the layman here? Again, I don't want to focus on any one particular cancer compound. They, 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 one of the, they relate to certain uh, compounds that are being used uh, and being promoted uh, by a physician in Texas. We are committed to providing expanded access and availability to American patients for any drug that there's reason to believe may work. They would not back down in making sure Brzezinski's criminal trial moved forward. Federal prosecutors concede that a cancer doctor they will put on trial here in January for using an innovative but unapproved drug has been saving lives. The prosecution marks the first time the FDA has tried to jail a scientist for using a drug on which he is conducting FDA-authorized clinical trials. In a pretrial motion, Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike Clark objected to a defense request for the jury to visit the chemical plant where Dr. Brzezinski manufactures anti-neoplaston. The jury visit request is a thinly veiled effort to expose the jury to the specter of Dr. Brzezinski in his act of saving lives. Whether anti-neoplaston does or does not work is not an issue, and the jury should not be asked to decide the question. 
He added that if the issue comes up at trial, it would be an irrelevant, emotional, prejudicial, and misleading concern. The issue of whether anti-neoplastons work may not even come up during the trial. The judge says that's not relevant, but the defense contends that's exactly the point, that what was done in developing the drug and administering it was done to save lives. This trial cost the American taxpayer $60 million, while costing Dr. Brzezinski over $2.2 million. $700,000 of Brzezinski's legal defense was raised primarily by Dr. Julian Whitaker through his newsletter, Health and Healing. After Dr. Whitaker wrote of the plight and injustice being done to Dr. Brzezinski, his readers sent in close to 18,000 checks in small donations for Brzezinski's legal defense. The trial is expected to last about two months. The jury will then decide whether Brzezinski is a fraud or a medical pioneer. On March 4th, 1997, due to a deadlocked jury, the judge declared a mistrial. And after saying the government had not presented sufficient evidence, he ordered that Dr. Brzezinski be acquitted of nearly half of the 75 counts. You voted to acquit? To acquit, absolutely. Not guilty. Not guilty. I voted for acquittal. I voted my mind and my heart. I do not believe that Dr. Brzezinski is a criminal. And I had voted to acquit. But the FDA was still not backing down. They took Dr. Brzezinski to trial again. Though, after apparently accepting the absurdity of their case, on May 19th, the FDA suddenly dropped 40 of the 41 remaining charges. The FDA's facade in trying to convince the world that Brzezinski was a criminal was completely unraveling. Even the jurors who voted not guilty in the first case took time off of work to join the patient's protest in front of the courthouse during the second case. I am appalled at the Food and Drug Administration and their actions. We are here today basically to pr protest the witch hunt that's going on by the FDA. We have to stick together and really support these patients that are suffering, not only health-wise, but having to come down here to make a stand against the FDA. Please don't waste my money abusing the system to make sure that you maintain your power. The jury spent about three hours deliberating this house of cards, leaving Brzezinski acquitted of the final charge. Every one of Dr. Brzezinski's patients now, every future Brzezinski patient is and will be on a clinical trial. There are many patients who would like to testify on my behalf and convince the jury and the judge that uh, without a treatment they will die. But the judge did not admit any statements which could show that the treatment is effective. The judge did not allow the jury to visit our facility where we produce medicine. They were trying to keep it away from the jury. If uh, this information would be presented to the jurors, then this trial would be finished very quickly. And that's what the jurors told us, because after the trial we talked to the jurors, and they were shocked that uh, such information about the treatment, which is saving the life of a patient, was not presented to them. And I was sick listening to the lies of prosecutors from, from U.S. attorneys. It was not necessary for, for them to do it. They could tell the truth. They represented the biggest power, but they still were doing this all the time. So they were trying to do it a sneaky way. And that's what is horrible, okay? That's what should be exposed, because I think the United States deserves better. While all of this was taking place, Brzezinski knew that the easiest way to keep the government from putting him out of business or in prison was to partner with an established pharmaceutical company. An interest was shown from Japanese pharmaceutical company Shugai and the Italian pharmaceutical company Sigma Tau, but both deals eventually evaporated, likely due to the rapport developed so far between antineoplastons and the FDA, being an issue indeed, and were unable to verify the likelihood that they could openly and effectively work with the FDA. Then, by 1990, it seemed that Brzezinski's luck had finally changed. Brzezinski had apparently treated the sister-in-law of the chairman and CEO 
of Elan Pharmaceuticals. Elan enthusiastically drafted a letter of intent stating they would aggressively pursue the filing of necessary protocols with the Food and Drug Administration for approval and marketing of antineoplastons as quickly as possible. They soon negotiated financing, licensing agreements, and royalties. In the midst of closing this deal with Elan, more good news emerged. Dr. Davorit Samid, a scientist and medical professor from Maryland who Brzezinski had hired to further study antineoplastons, managed to present her work at an oncology symposium in Switzerland, which landed her and antineoplastons a cover story in a 1990 issue of Oncology News. In 1989, we retained Dr. Dvorit Samit as our consultant. Dr. Samit at that time worked at Uniformed Services Medical School in Baltimore, and later she moved to the National Cancer Institute. Uh, she did a lot of work uh, with antioplasm ingredients. Unfortunately, when uh, the pharmaceutical company entered the picture, such as Ilan Pharmaceutical, uh, our consultant, Dr. Samir, became too close. She really became consultant for Ilan Pharmaceutical and she was working with Ilan from this time. And suddenly, Elan Pharmaceuticals terminated their licensing agreement, stating, Elan has significant doubt as to whether the active substances comprising of antineoplastons have patent protection, thereby rendering an agreement meaningless. Antineoplastons are not just one chemical. You have different ingredients in antineoplastons, okay? One of these ingredients was known and uh, before we discovered that this is metabolite of uh, antineoplastin and uh, was known and was available before okay so when we patented uh, our invention our lawyers told us look uh, you can't patent this particular ingredient because it was known before okay so let's list it in your patent but don't patent this because because you won't you never get patent for that okay but this is the least important ingredient of antineoplastins while this was an odd turn of events more good news continued to pour in it was in October 1991 when Dr. Nicholas Patronus led the National Cancer Institute on their site visit, the very same site visit Dr. Patronus would later base his testimony when defending Brzezinski against the Texas Medical Board. This site visit not only confirmed that antineoplastons were curing what was previously considered incurable brain cancer, but it garnered their interest in conducting a confirmatory trial under Division of Cancer Treatment Sponsorship at the National Cancer Institute. These trials involved most of their top experts, including Dr. Michael Friedman, the Associate Director of the Cancer Therapy Evaluation Program. In a memo addressed to his director, Dr. Friedman wrote, I thought you would be interested in this. Antineoplastons deserve a closer look. It turns out that the agents are well-defined, pure chemical entities. The human brain tumor responses are real. The National Cancer Institute's decision network then convened and gave the green light to conduct government-sponsored clinical trials of antineoplastons. Initially, everybody was very excited about it. Everybody would like to proceed. Uh, the people who uh, reviewed uh, our results, the experts from the NCI, they did a very good job. Uh, they were critical, of course, but uh, they were also highly complimentary for uh, the way we treat patients and the results we got. Okay? So it looks like everything should open and we move forward. Suddenly, everything came to the stop. And then we found that uh, a few months later, Ilan received permission to do clinical trials with this particular ingredient. Okay? Our was pushed back for some like four years, and then Ilan was allowed to proceed with this one suddenly. When Ilan terminated their business deal with Brzezinski, they went behind his back, recruited Dr. Davorit Samid, and partnered with the National Cancer Institute, where Dr. Samid soon became a section chief. Elan then co-sponsored laboratory research and clinical trials, testing only this single ingredient. 
called phenylacetate, the same chemical that Brzezinski was advised he couldn't patent and had already proven to be quite limited against cancer as a single substance as far back as 1980. After the treatment of a small number of patients, we found that the activity was quite limited. That's why we decided to abandon phenylacetate and we use uh, the other antineoplastins. One of them contained phenylacetate as uh, the second ingredient. Phenylacetate alone has very small activity, it's not very effective. In uh, 1994, uh, I started uh, working for uh, Deborah Samid. She didn't uh, let me know that uh, those, uh, one of the, those compounds is from Brzezinski, Dr. Brzezinski. You know, it's just say phenylacetate and show me all the published paper about phenylacetate and its analogs and their anti-cancer activity. It was quite amazing uh, in the lab because if you find a compound that has anti-cancer activity and then you find a bunch of analogs. It's like you stumbled in a pan, a pile of gold. So people think, hey, say, you know, patents, 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 you know, that sort of thing. Devoted under uh, his, uh, her uh, leadership, we find a lot of biological activities of these compounds. So it would have anti-cancer activity. So the scientists at John Hopkins tried to patent these compounds. But of course, Devore was working with Iran Pharmaceutical Company at that time. So those guys at Johns Hopkins didn't have any chance of patenting uh, those compounds. So, you know, um, but it's interesting that she would complain in the lab and saying that these guys, you know, it's try to, you know, go behind her back and patent these compounds. While Brzezinski was facing continuous harassment from state and federal agencies, the earliest phenylacetate studies were published in April of 92, authored by Devorit Samid, hosted by the National Cancer Institute. Brzezinski sat in awe as he witnessed the National Cancer Institute recruit one of his researchers, push his research aside, and begin to test phenylacetate without him. Reporting, phenylacetate is both effective in inducing tumor cell maturation and free of cytotoxic and carcinogenic effects, a combination that warrants attention to its potential use in cancer intervention. 1995, you know, uh, in the lab, I was still with Devore, but I smell fishy. Something is not right. The first paper Devore published about uh, phenylacetate, if you look at the methodology section, there's a BRI abbreviation. She got materials from Brzezinski Research Institute, Houston, Texas, but it didn't say Brzezinski Research Institute for us as scientists. It's a funny practice. Brzezinski's name failed to appear in the acknowledgments or any of the references listed in this report. Brzezinski knew these tests would fail, since he had already proven this in his own laboratory 12 years before. Abandoned by the National Cancer Institute, he sat powerless on the sidelines as the attempted hijacking of his discovery unfolded before his eyes, ending in the hideous train wreck he warned them it would. The National Cancer Institute, Elan, and Dr. Samid spent over four years and tens of millions of dollars testing phenylacetate. Phenylacetate, really, by itself has very little c clinical effect. The NCI or ELAN could not use the other ingredients of angioplasm because they were covered by the patents owned by me. So they were trying to commercialize this, but without the other ingredients, they couldn't do much with this. This needed to be given in conjunction with the others. While coming to terms with this reality, the National Cancer Institute decided to honor the government-sponsored clinical trials of antineoplastons they had initially promised Brzezinski in 1991. These trials have been conducted at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota and the Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York. Currently, there are only eight patients enrolled. I'm very dissatisfied with that because our desire is to achieve the proper enrollment 
in as quickly a manner as we can in order to really test this hypothesis. Friedman blamed Brzezinski for this slow motion, saying Brzezinski restricted admissions to the trials too stringently. To speed things up, admission standards for the trials have been lowered to bring in patients in worse physical condition. This over Dr. Brzezinski's strenuous objections. We got the idea that the main uh, interest is to uh, let this patient die rapidly and make sure that treatment will never work. Dr. Brzezinski has threatened legal action to halt these new admissions, and NCI has suspended recruiting, leaving the trials with just those scientifically unsatisfactory eight patients. Meanwhile, both the FDA and the Texas Medical Board are still trying to stop Brzezinski. On May 8th of 95, less than two weeks before this broadcast, the National Cancer Institute issued an internal memo to all of those involved in the anti-neoplaston trials. For the record, the Clinical Trials Monitoring Service has been instructed not to send any anti-neoplastons clinical trial data to Dr. Brzezinski, the Brzezinski Research Institute, or anyone inquiring about the anti-neoplastons clinical trials. Any inquiries that may be related to the trials or Dr. Brzezinski are to be referred to the Associate Director, Dr. Michael Friedman. Friedman then taunts Brzezinski. I must convey my deep pessimism. We are in no way obligated to obtain your consent. Your insistence on dictating the manner in which we conduct or review these clinical trials is both presumptuous and inappropriate. The future of these trials rests entirely with the NCI, since our primary obligation is to the American public. Brzezinski responds, Your letter of June 6 conveys pessimism? My letter conveys outrage. Patients were admitted against admission criteria, their treatment was discontinued, and their lives were jeopardized for frivolous reasons. In spite of your promise, we never received any detailed data on these patients. There must be a reason why you are afraid to provide us with complete copies of medical records. It took us at least half a year before we force NCI to release some of this information to us. And then we found that they severely violated protocol. They did not comply at all with the protocol. On the top of that, patients uh, were forced to stop the teaching of antioplastins because of massive fluid retention. And this is something which we don't see with antioplastins. Typical effect of antioplastins is uh, dehydration, which means elimination of the fluids. The patients are losing a lot of fluids to the point that they have to drink a lot of extra fluid. We don't see increased fluid retention. I was curious why this could happen. I knew that the patients were receiving a lot of intravenous fluid, but then uh, we learned that perhaps the fluid which they were receiving were not antineoplastins. In October of 1995, the National Cancer Institute's Cancer Information Service issued a public statement for anyone inquiring about their clinical trials of antineoplastons. In it, they stated, because these studies were closed prior to completion, no conclusions can be made about the effectiveness or toxicity of antineoplastons. To their credit, and according to the scientific standards set by the National Cancer Institute, this was indeed the truth. However, four years after these trials were closed and two years after Brzezinski defeated the FDA and won his freedom, the National Cancer Institute just couldn't leave well enough alone and decided to vindictively publish these scientifically invalid antineoplaston trials in the peer-reviewed medical literature. In it, they described how nine patients were treated and no patient demonstrated tumor regression. However, whoever was responsible for publishing this report was apparently careless enough to also include the antineoplastons concentrations detected in the blood of the nine patients during treatment. We compared this to the data which we have in our studies. We found that they were severely diluting the medicine, and this was why the patient had fluid overload. Antioplaston AS2-1 uh, consists of two ingredients, which is called phenylacetate and uh, phenylacetate and about 2.7 times lower level of phenylacetate in patients' blood compared to what we see in other patients who receive successful treatment. 
phenyl acid glutamine, there is about 36 times lower level in patient's blood compared to what we see in our patients receiving the right dosage of antineoplastins. And the concentrations of phenylacetyl isoglutamine, one of the main ingredients of antineoplastin A10, were close to 170 times lower than what we see in the treatment of patients with antineoplastins. And that's what we found from uh, patients' husbands or patients themselves, okay? That's what they were doing, okay? So this was horrible, okay? This was like a criminal act, okay? They should be prosecuted for that, okay? Because obviously they knew what they were doing and they knew that uh, these patients have really no chance to respond to any treatment, they are going to die, okay? And that's what happened. After we realized what they do, we decided to force them to stop clinical trials. And since then, obviously, National Cancer Institute hates us, okay? <laughs> they do whatever they can, obviously, do not cooperate with us anymore. In the past, when NCI or its assigned entity conducting an alternative cancer therapy, they always altered the protocol and let it fail to discredit the therapy. But this time, the pharmacokinetic data shows that they didn't do it right. And most scientists would not look at it carefully because Papa is telling you something and you don't question him. After the National Cancer Institute intentionally violated all protocols of their own antineoplaston trials, and after all state and federal agencies had failed in their 14-year campaign to remove Brzezinski from society, after all of the dust settled, a profound truth began to emerge. It was October 4th, 1991, that America's National Cancer Institute hosted their site visit to Brzezinski's clinic and verified for themselves that anti-tumor activity was documented by the use of anti-neoplastons. Seventeen days later, on October 21st, 1991, the United States of America, as represented by the Department of Health and Human Services, and Dr. Daborit Samid filed a patent for antineoplastons AS2-1. They even had the audacity to include Brzezinski as a reference. The invention described herein may be manufactured, used, and licensed by or for the government for governmental purposes. At the time, Brzezinski had no idea this had happened but did have his suspicions when they began to openly test phenyl acetate without him. And the National Cancer Institute knew it. In an April 93 NCI memo distributed to those involved with Brzezinski, they state their concerns. Political issues are a real concern. Congressman Bedell is concerned we are taking the anti-neoplastons away from Brzezinski. Brzezinski has patent on anti-neoplastons. Since phenylacetic acid, or phenyl acetate, may be the active component in antineoplastons, our involvement has become an issue. Five months later, the United States of America and Dr. Devorit Samid file their second extended patent on antineoplastons. And guess who else was in it? In March of the following year, America files its most extensive updated antineoplaston patent to date, spanning 111 pages. Seven months later, they file a fourth one. June 6, 1995, the United States government has a field day filing their fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth extended patent on antineoplastons. The following day, America files its ninth, tenth, and eleventh extended antineoplaston patent. And a couple of months after the eleventh patent was filed, Dr. Michael Friedman leaves his position at the National Cancer Institute and becomes Deputy Commissioner of Operations for the Food and Drug Administration, working directly under Dr. David Kessler. And by November of that year, after a decade of failed grand juries, the United States of America's Food and Drug Administration finally manages to indict Dr. Brzezinski. 
One month into America's criminal trial against Brzezinski, America's first patent on anti-neoplaston AS2-1 is approved. A month after America fails in their second trial against Brzezinski, their second and third anti-neoplaston patents are approved. Over the course of the next three years, the United States Patent Office approves all 11 copycat patents on anti-neoplastons AS2-1. And as you know, all of this was done based on the fact that the United States, which is National Institute of Health, together with pharmaceutical company, which is Elan Pharmaceuticals, was trying simply to steal my invention. That's what they wanted, okay? It's not that uh, we had successful visit from the National Cancer Institute in which they determined that this treatment works great, and uh, they decided that we should go through phase uh, two clinical trials, which will be sponsored by them. No. This gave the idea of some higher-ups of FDA to conspire with pharmaceutical company so that they can steal the invention from me and get it, because it was good, okay? <laughs> so that's the whole story, okay? And uh, they knew that if uh, I be still free, they won't be able to do it. Because they knew that if I would sue them, they would uh, have a chance in court, because we have our patents <laughs> before, okay? So that's why the, the attempts from them to wipe me out financially, to put me to prison, to attack me from every possible angle, FDA, which is federal government, state government, to be able to steal my invention, okay? That's, that's the real thing from the National Cancer Institute and uh, Ilan Pharmaceutical. They failed. <laughs> we survived and we moved forward. These patents are full of useful information. Aside from noticing their blatant infringement, compositions and methods for treating and preventing cancer, using the distribution of anti-neoplastons AS2-1's ingredients, they enthusiastically state the neoplastic conditions treatable by this method include neuroblastoma, leukemia, myelodysplasia, acute glioma, prostate cancer, breast cancer, melanoma, lung cancer, medulloblastoma, and lymphoma to name a few. They also point out how antineoplastons can also be used as a cancer preventative. However, the most revealing piece of information found in these patents is where they state current approaches to combat cancer rely primarily on the use of chemicals and radiation, which are themselves carcinogenic and may promote recurrences, and the development of metastatic disease. Let's read that one again, shall we? Current approaches to combat cancer rely primarily on the use of chemicals and radiation, which are themselves carcinogenic and may promote recurrences, and the development of metastatic disease. They in some time have a creed, it's to separate the medicine from the medicine men. And of course, uh, these higher up at NCI or whatever, they think, hey guys, we have been doing this for years. We know what's going on. Uh, so they think, well, we know what's going on with phenoacetate, phenoacetylglutamine. If you can outsmart the medicine man, you can cut a piece of a pie for yourself. That's the name of the game. If you cannot be the first one, if you can the second one and be bigger than the first one, still. Why not? That's the men mentality. You know, under the capitalist sun, there's nothing sacred. Money talks. The smearing campaign against us continues uh, from good doctors, from uh, American Medical Association, from American Cancer Society, despite of the fact that it should stop a long time ago. What do you mean by this Plaston study? What is that? Antineoplastons are peptides, which I discovered, uh, which uh, can uh, stimulate genes which fight cancer and which can decrease the activity of the genes uh, which uh, cause cancer. And These are molecular switches. You published that? Yes, yeah. we published. I published about 300 articles. <laughs> and I presented that? numerous... Uh, uh, at numerous well, that seems revolutionary. Do you discount that? I've known of what he's been doing and I think uh, you know the work that he's doing there's no scientific evidence that it provides any benefit for cancer patients. Uh, he's discounting all the work? Yes. 
He also states that there's no complications or very little complications in his treatment. And I've actually had one patient that went to him and had the treatment uh, and almost died. Four years after my diagnosis, I had run into one of the neuro-oncologists that I met with and told him that I had gone to Dr. Brzezinski and I was cured, and he, he kind of wrote it off. I was very excited to tell him that I was cured, and he really burst my bubble about it, so it was, it was somewhat depressing <laughs> for me. You have uh, an amazing story of survival sitting right next to you, a young woman named Jody Gold. Jody, I understand that you actually had a very advanced uh, malignant brain tumor uh, diagnosed right before you turned 32 years old, and here you are with us today. Exactly, and I'm actually here today because I participated in a clinical trial. I don't know why Dr. Black is not telling the truth. We conducted 12 phase two clinical trials under strict FDA supervision in every one of these trials. We have objective responsive treatment. We prove that treatment works, that even can cure incurable brain tumors. The patients can live not only over five years tumor-free, but over 10 years tumor-free from the types of tumors where chemotherapy can do absolutely nothing. This is well documented. This was reviewed by the top specialists in the United States, but it was never reviewed by Dr. Black. He didn't review even a single case treated by us. Why are you not, why are you not we open to... patients whom Dr. Black advised do not come to us 11 years ago for incurable brain tumors. Her tumor was gone in two months. She's now 11 years later in perfect health, living here in L.A. And Dr. Black told her, you'll be wasting time and money coming to not, Dr. Why are you not, why as, a good, this, why you not as a good doctor? Why are you not open to this? Well, Actually, I'm, I'm open to anything that would benefit my patients. The, the doctors I know and the, and the clinicians I know, and, the, and, and the, these people are evangelical. I mean, they are hugely vested and invested in doing what they believe is very important and good work. It helps them get up in the morning to go to work. So folks who are invested in that kind of uh, you know, zealous way you know, are going to look at anything that isn't within that, 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 that vision, you know, they're going to look askance at it. They're going to look at, you know, saying that, that's, that's really weird, or that's a charlatan. My oncologist, the radiologist, uh, the MRI guy, you know, and everybody we talked to said, you know, he's a quack, you can't do, you can't, you should not do that. I mean, he's dangerous. And, um, we basically said, well, we did our research and this is what we want to do and you can't do anything for me, so why not? Well, it's not good. It's not smart. It's a fake. It's a scam. He's going to take your money and you're not going to get anything. I mean, it was, it was everything that you'd hear from someone that didn't know anything about it but really didn't want to do it. So, but they weren't in the position that we were in. It didn't seem that they had any facts and figures and concrete evidence to debunk him. Good point. It was just maybe what they had heard. One doctor told Susan, if you were my sister and you wanted to go to Dr. Brzezinski clinic, I would stand on the runway in front of the airplane to keep you from flying to Houston. He got a little dramatic about it. I got pretty thoroughly annoyed with some of these doctors who would tell me he's a crook, a quack, a charlatan, he's never really cured anybody. And I would ask them, how do you know this? Well, it's just what I've heard. So I would say to them, if you think you're a scientist, how can you go based on just what you've heard? If Dr. Brzezinski's treatment is so effective, and so many of his patients say that it is, why then is it not used here at MD Anderson, one of the nation's leading cancer hospitals? Simple, say doctors here. It doesn't cure cancer. Well, I don't have any evidence, so that's for certain. Dr. Mari Markman is head of research at MD Anderson. His claims have certainly not uh, reached the level of uh, acceptance in the um, 
uh, medical community. He says there can be lots of explanations why certain patients recover, but to say it's because of Brzezinski's treatment, you can't say that, he says. And if there was such proof, if it worked, you'd be all over it. Absolutely. But Dr. Brzezinski thinks there may be something else at work. Big institutions may not like being upstaged by an outsider. The doctor at MD Anderson disagrees. We had actually asked what the endocrinologist at MD Anderson about Dr. Brzezinski, and he told us he was a quack and that that there was no evidence that that worked. But at that point, it was like, well, yours doesn't really work either. You know, I looked at it like, well, you know, if she's got approximately nine months to live, then, you know, we come over here and we don't have all the side effects. Well, you know, in nine months' time, which am I going to be better off doing? Right. If the end, if the ending result is the same. I think what is amazing is that Dr. Brzezinski has had a vision and a passion and a zeal for 40 odd years, put up with being called everything short of and probably even including a witch doctor um, because of his firm belief that he can save people's lives. And I mean, what that says about his character and his just his, the, the fiber of his backbone to, um, to be willing to take that on um, and and to and to and 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 to be alive when uh, and recognized when it happens. I mean, there are many times in history where great inventors, you know, the, the inventor or the or the uh, has has basically died or was impoverished before they had a chance to to see the fruition of that great invention. And he's got a chance of doing that. In eighteen forty. Ignaz Semmelweis, an Austrian obstetrician, noted that over 20%, that's one out of five, women giving birth in the hospital died four to six days later of peripheral fever. These women were then autopsied in the basement of the hospital. And the doctors who performed these autopsies wore no gloves. Can you imagine that? Believe it or not, they then would leave the autopsy room and go straight to the delivery room to assist other births without even washing their hands. Then Dr. Samovice's good friend and fellow physician accidentally cut his finger while he was doing an autopsy. In six days, this doctor died with the same signs and symptoms of peripheral fever. All of a sudden, Samovice knew. He realized that the doctors were transferring the disease from the autopsy room to the delivery room, and he urged his colleagues to simply wash their hands. For this unforgivable sacrilege, he was drummed out of the medical profession and he died in an insane asylum. Now today, we have the same kind of arrogant commitment to belief. But with cancer treatment, we have a trillion dollar business built on those beliefs. So if you think Samovic had a problem, just imagine the problem Dr. Brzezinski faces. There was no money involved in hand washing versus non hand washing. Dr. Sawanabari wants to figure out how the clinic administers anti neoplastins and targeted gene therapy. Dr. Brzezinski has been working with doctors in Japan for years. In fact, it was evidence from patients in Japan that convinced the FDA here to allow earlier studies in stage two trials. His method is uh, very safe and uh, also very effective mm -hmm. so I'm sure that this is the uh, new strategy of cancer treatment and discovered it was a brainstem glioma. And they explained that hers was um, diffuse where it was like the healthy tissue and the cancerous tissue were swirled together. So of course surgery wasn't an option. And with the um, radiation they suggested, her prognosis was probably gonna be about eight to 18 months. The thing is with the radiation, what it would do to you from what I understood was they would shoot the beam through your ears 
and the beam would burn your healthy and your cancerous cells inside or outside in. So all your hair around your ears would be gone, never grow back. Your ears would become deformed and burnt. You would become deaf because you couldn't hear. Um, it would also destroy your pituitary gland, which is the gland that helps you grow. Uh, as you hit puberty. Yeah, she was 11 at the time and that was a real concern I had. And it'd make you stay in an 11 year old body mm -hmm. um, and basically in the end you'd become of the, in a vegetated state where you couldn't take care of yourself which wasn't a very good quality of life. Because my big concern was with uh, the oncologist originally that we were dealing with was you know how it was going to affect her development and when she started to enter the teenage years starting a period and growing and developing and he just looked at me and he said well frankly Mrs. Russell she's not going to live that long. What she would have to go through in those extra months that would be horrible. I wouldn't want to go through it. Why do it? You're handed the death sentence anyway. <laughs> so what was the point of the radiation? You know you then you, you have to say okay modern medicine doesn't have an answer. Let's find our own. When you look at what is going on and how Dr. Brzezinski is being handled, it is clearly a function of, you know, anytime you have big business, big government, big labor, big pharma, big cancer industry, whatever, they become so wrapped up in protecting the institution, whatever it is, that they forget what their fundamental job is. You know, and what's happened with big pharma and, and big cancer is they kind of, you know, they've forgotten to be curious about that there might be other uh, opportunities and options out there, and they're focused on protecting their turf. Due to this reality, combined with the continued failed efforts of state and federal agencies in their attempts to stop Brzezinski from continuing to treat patients and expand his research, special interest groups have since launched a relentless propaganda campaign against Dr. Brzezinski and his supporters and patients in hopes that this game-changing innovation never reach the open market. And here's why. While most would assume that a breakthrough cancer treatment of this magnitude would be widely celebrated by the industry and encouraged for no other reason than its monetary worth, when one applies the logic and reason of the scientific method to this idea, this theory has no foundation or basis in fact. The primary reason that the cancer industry and its regulatory agencies fear the approval of antineoplastons is purely economical. If antineoplastons were FDA approved for just one cancer type, even the smallest and obscure of cancer types, like brainstem tumors in children, where antineoplastons hold the first cures in medical history, but only afflicts a few hundred children per year, this would mean that anyone of any age diagnosed with any type of cancer, like breast, lung, or liver, could legally insist their oncologists provide them with antineoplastons off-label. Given the gentle and non-toxic nature of these medications, most reasonable people would begin to opt for antineoplastons as a first line of defense against their cancer, instead of first choosing the outdated modalities of toxic, life-threatening chemotherapy and radiation. Since approximately 40% of all men and women will develop cancer in their lifetimes, the FDA approval of antineoplastons on any level will reap financial devastation to the medical industry and could send Wall Street into a downward spiral. Additionally, since these patented medications have been in FDA clinical testing for more than 20 years, theoretically, the patents have expired but technically they are still partially protected due to being in the limbo of FDA clinical trials. Once antineoplastons are FDA approved for market, the entity owning their patent rights will only have up to seven years of cornering the cancer treatment market before these medications devolve into a generic drug. Once they become generic, like the antibiotic, their prices will plummet indefinitely allowing any global drug company to produce and sell antineoplastons, effectively destroying the current high-profit paradigm that the cancer industry has relied on for more than 40 years. Due to this stark reality, special interest groups are making every possible attempt to derail the approval of antineoplastons, 
demonize their inventor while relentlessly trying to confuse the public about the truth of this story and the invention of antineoplastons themselves. The primary weapon in this deceitful propaganda is what is defined as an astroturf campaign. What is astroturf? It's a perversion of grassroots, as in fake grassroots. Astroturf is when political, corporate, or other special interests disguise themselves and publish blogs, start Facebook and Twitter accounts, publish ads, letters to the editor, or simply post comments online to try to fool you into thinking an independent or grassroots movement is speaking. The whole point of AstroTurf is to try to give the impression there's widespread support for or against an agenda when there's not. AstroTurf seeks to manipulate you into changing your opinion by making you feel as if you're an outlier when you're not. A carefully constructed narrative by unseen special interests designed to manipulate your opinion. A Truman Show-esque alternate reality all around you. Complacency in the news media combined with incredibly powerful propaganda and publicity forces mean we sometimes get little of the truth. Special interests have unlimited time and money to figure out new ways to spin us while cloaking their role. Surreptitious astroturf methods are now more important to these interests than traditional lobbying of Congress. There's an entire industry built around it in Washington. Astroturfers seek to controversialize those who disagree with them. They attack news organizations that publish stories they don't like, whistleblowers who tell the truth, politicians who dare to ask the tough questions, and journalists who have the audacity to report on all of it. Sometimes astroturfers simply shove intentionally so much confusing and conflicting information into the mix that you're left to throw up your hands and disregard all of it, including the truth. Drown out a link between a medicine and a harmful side effect, say vaccines and autism, by throwing a bunch of conflicting paid for studies, surveys, and experts into the mix, confusing the truth beyond recognition. And then there's Wikipedia. AstroTurf's dream come true. Billed as the free encyclopedia that anyone can edit, the reality can't be more different. Anonymous Wikipedia editors control and co-opt pages on behalf of special interests. They forbid and reverse edits that go against their agenda. They skew and delete information in blatant violation of Wikipedia's own established policies with impunity, always superior to the poor schlubs who actually believe anyone can edit Wikipedia, only to discover they're barred from correcting even the simplest factual inaccuracies. Try adding a footnoted fact or correcting a fact error on one of these monitored Wikipedia ages and pages and poof, sometimes within a matter of seconds you'll find your edit is reversed. In 2012, famed author Philip Roth tried to correct a major fact error about the inspiration behind one of his book characters cited on a Wikipedia page. But no matter how hard he tried, Wikipedia's editors wouldn't allow it. They kept reverting the edits back to the false information. When Roth finally reached a person at Wikipedia, which was no easy task, and tried to find out what was going wrong, they told him he simply was not considered a credible source on himself. <laughs> a few weeks later, there was a huge scandal when Wikipedia officials got caught offering a PR service that skewed and edit information on behalf of paid, publicity-seeking clients in utter opposition to Wikipedia's supposed policies. All of this may be why, when a medical study looked at medical conditions described on Wikipedia pages and compared it to actual peer-reviewed published research, Wikipedia contradicted medical research 90% of the time. You may never fully trust what you read on Wikipedia again, nor should you. This anti-Brzezinski propaganda campaign began in November of 2011 with science blogs, which nearly went under after accepting paid propaganda messages masked as editorials by corporate giant PepsiCo, as well as science-based medicine, which in turn spawned the website The Houston Cancer Quack under the guise of an astroturf organization called the Skeptics for the Protection of Cancer Patients. After this bogus group was established, they opened Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, blog incessantly, start petitions, even comparing Brzezinski's FDA sanctions activities to the infamous Tuskegee experiment where doctors intentionally gave scores of African-Americans syphilis. 
This group also launched a grossly deceiving and manipulative website called the Other Brzezinski Patient Group, which consists of a list of unconfirmed former patients allegedly treated by Brzezinski's organization who allegedly died under its care without providing the unsuspecting reader full names or sources. This effort was created to usurp a legitimate organization called the Brzezinski Patient Group, which has been in existence since the 1990s. This group also bombards the FDA and the Texas Medical Board with petitions, emails, and phone calls accusing those agencies of not doing their job and stopping the Brzezinski Clinic and the Brzezinski Research Institute from continuing to operate. This group has also managed to fool unsuspecting members of the mainstream press, like Liz Scheibo of USA Today. After they assembled all of these propaganda components on their chessboard, they then deleted the Stanislaw Brzezinski and Antineoplaston Wikipedia pages and consolidated them into a single Brzezinski Clinic Wikipedia page that they exclusively control. By linking to the articles by members of the press they've manipulated, linking to their own blog posts, while also leaving commentary on PubMed, pretending to be medical experts and reviewers, and then deviously use their own fraudulent medical review commentary as Wikipedia sources to give the illusion that there is overwhelming opposition to the safety and efficacy of antineoplastons, this group has also infiltrated and manipulated a global group that calls themselves the Skeptics, a group that ironically promotes critical thinking and the scientific method. The following is what happens when an unsuspecting, card-carrying skeptic who's had the wool pulled over his eyes by this devious group is confronted with fact. And this has been going on for 35 years with no published results That's in a in a untrue peer, in a in a peer reviewed journal that with, is absolutely with untrue where, you guys because you haven't read it you take the well, position where, that where, it doesn't exist where have those I, let's from? meet let's meet for for lunch one day i'll pay i'll buy you lunch and i'll bring you all of the published peer reviewed clinical data I would love how to about see that it. Okay. I would love to see it. But I have good. to say, I mean, the, where I, from, from where I'm coming from, I've done a lot of research. I haven't found where anything other than the research. Two. Where did you do your research? You can look on uh, Medline. You can look on PubMed. You can you can search. I mean, right. you can search Brzezinski. You can search Antonioplastons. Have you, ever, have you ever talked to Dr. Brzezinski? Have you ever been to Houston? No. Have you ever gone to the clinic? Wouldn't you say that it would be a, a much more effective way and a much better way of getting at the truth of what's going on if you go and talk to him? No, because I haven't talked to every single person in the world who I've ever heard something that I have researched and found to be false. I mean, you don't necessarily believe in unicorns. I have been contacted by numerous people, if not dozens at this point, of a lot of people that have been personally hurt by what you guys are doing. Well, one and, thing and one thing I could right. tell you for it's, certain. I'm telling you now, it's not right. It's not, you're not doing a morally good thing and you're hurting people. And people may die as a result of what you're doing. And you yeah. think you're saving people, but you're not. And this is what happens when a legitimate member of the skeptic community finds out what these AstroTurf imposters have maliciously done in their name. This uh, film was, was great. I, I uh, don't have a question, but I, I think that one of the people on the, uh, can respond. I happen to be the head skeptic in Orange County. And I think that this film negatively reflects what skeptics are all about. I agree with everything in this film because it's been tested. It's been tested in different countries. So I want you to re respond on, I know that there is a, a skeptic that was introduced in your film, which I am appalled by being a skeptic myself. Mm. I operate on promoting science. I provide have skeptics groups. I have over a thousand people in my group in Orange County. And I think that I'm going to recommend this movie to all of them. Yay. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. History hasn't changed much. Scientific fact continues to be often based not on science or peer review, but the projected illusion and manufacturing of a perceived majority consensus. Oh, in surprise and alarm. Oh, you mean sort of a... Ah! ah. Yes, right. oh. Otherwise known as pseudoscience. The very idea this opposition vehemently pretends to oppose.
So it's August 26, 2015. Yes. Yeah. Last time I saw you guys was in 2012. We've definitely come a long way. Uh, we got married last year, so. Yeah. And that wasn't yeah. something that. That we ever thought we'd be doing. Well, I never thought I'd get married first no, but off. That... But obviously, with, with what happened to Hannah and her prognosis, it, that looked like it would never happen either. But yeah, it's a miracle, you know? And we've just done everything we can to get on and enjoy our life. Yes! <laughs> Dr. Pazinski's treatment saved her life. Uh, people can think what they want, you know, because, you know, a lot of people think that Dr. Pazinski is, I don't know, a fraud or charlatan or crook or whatever they want to think. And one thing in life, you should always try and respect the beliefs that other people have, you know, but it's very hard to respect the beliefs of people who really want to see this guy just cleared out, stamped out, killed, or well, not killed, but, you know, professionally killed. What I've seen along the way, because I kind of, uh, kept all of this away from Anne. I didn't want her to see how much hatred there is for this guy. And I know he's being taken to court again by the Texas Medical Board, what, for the third time? You know, twice by the FDA. When's it ever going to stop? But I remember Dr. Pazinski saying something to me. He said, I said, why do you keep doing this? You know? And he said, I have to, you know, you know, I have to keep going. He said, but I probably won't get recognized for this work until I'm dead. And, uh, you know, it's, there isn't a day goes by when I don't think how lucky we are, um, but how it scares the crap out of me that there are a lot of people who might never get this treatment, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people who are convinced, absolutely 100%, that he's that this treatment doesn't work. She was accepted on a phase two clinical trial, it worked, and, and she's trying to get on with her life as best as she can. Whereas for me, uh, it's a little bit different because I feel a massive debt to him and uh, I get contacted probably every two or three weeks by someone with a brain tumor asking me for my, for help and advice and we want to say thank you obviously to you Eric because if you hadn't have made this film I, I probably never would have found out about the treatment uh, I want to say a massive thank you to Dr. Bozinski and all of the people in this clinic because you know they went to great lengths to help us yeah. you know this treatment didn't work for everyone but it definitely worked for some people. We spent seven weeks at that clinic. Hi, Daddy. Hello, how are you? Yeah, I'm sorry for ringing so late. That's all right. Um, but I'm ringing re really, really good news. Good, that's what I want to hear. Go on, you uh, tell me. No, you tell me. I don't think I can. Come on. Tell me. Um, Come on. My tumour yeah. has already shrunk by 10%. And and when I tried to talk to some of these people, some of the other doctors, none of the doctors who treated Hannah, the oncologist, none of them are interested in what you know, the fact five years she's nearly now, five years. Which means what? In cancer treatment that means we're cured, right? Yeah. Thinking I mean you made that up, but anyway. But it's just such a crazy world, you know? Such a crazy world because there are people out there all over the world that could really, this treatment could save their life and they'll probably never, ever, ever get it. You know, the other thing is, which a lot of people don't know, this the Japanese paper, this cha Japanese data was a phase two independent randomized trial. And that's what so many people wanted to see. But it's just so easy to say, oh, no, 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 push it away, push it away, push it away. But because the study wasn't very big, and they put the words in it that basically say it wasn't a big enough number, people just disregard it. It's like toilet paper. Love to see it all over and done with. You know, the drug approved, just him being getting, able to, yeah. Him getting the recognition that he deserves. So yeah, hopefully there will be a third movie. And who knows, maybe there'll be a happy ending to this, that this drug gets approved. Two years ago, we finished our phase two clinical trial program. We finished successfully 14 phase two clinical trials under FDA supervision, which proved not only 
uh, increased response rate, according to the protocol, uh, which means there was a proof of efficacy coming from phase two clinical trials, and a proof that the treatment is well tolerated. So basically, after we finished clinical trial program here in the United States, and after our Japanese colleagues reported exciting data in the treatment of uh, colorectal cancer which spread to the liver by running randomized controlled clinical trials which shows doubling long-term survival in such patients. We found ourselves under horrible harassment by regulatory agencies and by people who were hired by our adversaries. Then uh, the last uh, stage of quote-unquote war against us started. Uh, we are exposed to one of the longest in the history inspection by the FDA, which lasted almost three months. Then after we are able to sort out uh, the issues with the FDA, and FDA gave us green light to proceed with uh, additional clinical trials and move forward with the approval process, uh, we are furiously attacked by Texas Medical Board based on some frivolous charges. We had audit by Internal Revenue Service or IRS. We have also submitted to audit by uh, Security and Exchange Agency. And uh, these things, obviously, uh, we have nothing against, but it costs a lot of time and it costs a lot of money. We are out of this except for Texas Medical Board, which continue to harass us and clearly would like to destroy our clinic. We would like to close our clinic. Uh, started litigation of me personally and uh, oncologists and the other doctors who are working for our clinic. So simply, their action is aimed to destroy our activities and they would like to rush to do it quickly because they realize that we are very close to final approval of our medication. For some reason, they don't want to have cure of cancer. It's almost like a cancer industrial complex now. And it just, it's just heart-wrenching. I think most people think that they're just gonna wake up one morning and find a headline in the newspaper, hey, we just found a cure for cancer, that it's something that is going to be discovered by the pharmaceutical industry. And it's obvious to me, you know, after watching the Brzezinski first film and doing the research that I've done, that there are alternative therapies that already exist and that are doing positive things. And then when we have government institutions that use taxpayer dollars, that try to fight back against this good that's happening, it's mind blowing and I, I can't sit back and allow that to happen. I was told I had a fatal cancer and that they would treat me for a while with chemo and radiation, but eventually I would die of the disease. Did you die from the disease? No, I'm here today and I'm healthy and happy and so grateful to Dr. Brzezinski. Dr. Brzezinski saved my life. Do you believe you would be alive without Dr. Brzezinski? I know I would not be. But he's fighting the good fight, I believe for a very good reason. To me, that's the definition of what a hero is. So of course I'm gonna come out today and, and support that hero for sure. I think it's a, a travesty that, that a man that is basically bound by his own Hippocratic oath to look after the patients is now being trialed for doing what he was supposed to do. And, um, and it calls for a lot of people to stand up against this. It's actually, it's very saddening for me personally. I think that, I think that um, a lot of people aren't aware of how bad this really is. I think that unless we all stand up, um, things aren't going to get any better. And, and it really puts the onus back on us as a people. Like, we, we've got doctors that have got out and put their, put their lives, their families, their careers on the line. And Brzezinski is the, one of the best examples you can find in the world of that. And, um, and we as the people have to stand for, for, these, for these doctors that, that need our support, that need a voice to stand for them and say the truth is and, and, and to be bold about it. And I believe they should be exposed to some type of investigation to find out why they did it and why they purposely 
blindly follow the orders of the people who are behind and who told them to destroy us. So this is something which is a complete nonsense and uh, which America should investigate because it should not happen. Uh, hopefully this will be explained and we'll be relieved from this menace which is really hurting us and hurting patients. Well, I'm here, first of all, because Dr. Brzezinski saved my life. <laughs> and also, I believe that people have a right to choose whatever it is they want to do for their medical health. And um, that's our freedom in this country. But I'm mainly here because I feel like I owe Dr. Brzezinski to show people that what he does is not quackery. I mean, I was given, you know, two months to live, and here I am seven years later, and I'm totally fine. What type of cancer do you breast. I, ex breast. I experienced breast cancer. But I no longer experience any cancer in my body whatsoever. That's wonderful. You know, my wife was dying. I went to uh, Texas Oncology. They told us to make, make time to die. You have 60 days to live, or we can give you, you know, serious chemo, and maybe you'll live uh, one to two years. And so we said, you know, we're not accepting that. And we looked around, we found out Dr. Brzezinski went in and he gave us some hope. He said, I'm not sure, but I think we can turn this around. And in 60 days, the cancer that was in her lungs and in her sternum uh, was gone. It just disappeared. If you'd have seen the x-ray she had on her lungs, it was totally white. Then 60 days later, we did another uh, x-ray. Oh, nothing in there. And, uh, you know, what he, he discussed it with us, it just made perfect sense that, you know, if, if you're not working for the FDA or the drug companies, uh, there's a way to cure cancer. I'm 25, 25 years old at the end of the month, and there's been a cure for cancer that long. Plain and simple. <laughs>